Um, 24 to 40. The county is, has gotten a project approved uh, through Homeland Security grant funding for uh, what is called a pier system, two, two pier sites, which in, in uh, Lock Mullen has uh, once again come to our to our assistance here. Lock is 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 works with the Fort Bend County Office of Emergency Management, and they utilize pier probably about as well as anybody that I know of um, in in our state anyway. And down there, I believe all the all the jurisdictions in the Houston Galveston region have a pier site. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Uh, that they use they get that through your asset funding. That's, That's correct. correct. Yep. Um, we would what we've got uh, proposed is two pier sites, one that would be a day-to-day -day site for all the emergency management offices in our county, and then uh, one that would uh, remain uh, dark, but would be utilized during an event. Okay. So Locke's going to explain pier to us more, how it all kind of works, how it all kind of ties together with Facebook, Twitter, things like that. Um, I heard I heard him describe it earlier as, as a web EOC for PIOs, is that accurate? Uh, mm -hmm. So it's so it's a really neat tool, and uh, basically what I have is approval to uh, to put these two sites in for for 16 months. I have funding for 16 months, and all the training and everything that goes along with that. Um, so that should give us a really good uh, uh, look at it and decide if it's something that we want to continue continue on. And, uh, uh, I've already told everybody I, I'll be glad to use uh, the county's homeland security funding to try to, to, try to fund this project. We all see that something worthwhile after that 16 months. So, anyway, without further ado, Lock Mullen. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, let me start. Um, I, we, we've spared you all a sales pitch by having me come down, come up here instead. Um, they've worked with Dan Timmons, who's the regional vice president for Peer, to get the proposal and everything up and running. And he usually offers a pretty good sales pitch. So. We spared you all that by having me here, but I still want to rewind a little bit to do like kind of a 50,000 foot overview. Because um, when I show you things about the system, there's some stuff in there that probably won't make sense without the context. So the context is, um, this product was launched in the year 2000. Um, in 1999, on June 10th, uh, there was a pipeline explosion in the town where I'm from and where it appears from. Um, about a half a million gallons of gasoline leaked into a creek. It's a small town, well, I got to stop saying that. I thought it was a small town growing up, and it's about 80,000 people. Um, a creek runs right down the middle, about a half a million gallons of gas, and some kids playing with matches ignited it. So we had this tower of flames that went for several miles long, cut right through the middle of the city, and this black smoke. And, you know, we had the Navy coming in with their ships from Whidbey Island with their planes dumping, dumping wire on it, dumping water on it to put it out. And it was just this crazy incident. And so this sleepy town of Bellingham was all of a sudden on a map. <clears throat> now, uh, the founder of Peer Systems, his name is Gerald Barron, and he, at the time, he was uh, sort of on retainer as a PIO for Puget Sa Shell Puget Sound Refinery and for the Olympic Pipeline Company. Now, it was the Olympic Pipeline that leaked, and they were sending gas to the Shell Refinery. So he was sort of being PIO for both of the RPs, responsible parties in that case. Um, and he was in the basement of the courthouse in downtown Bellingham with phone lines that didn't work because they were jammed, all of a sudden national media attention, a single fax machine two blocks away, and just no workflow. Um, now, in 1999, it was a different world than we live in now, obviously. Uh, the internet was just growing legs, um, just starting to be used a little bit more professionally. Um, so he, he, you know, he went to a conference and he heard some guys talking about this thing called cold fusion, about how you could combine databases together. And he said, well, I'm going to build a product that replicates the faxing ability and just puts it up in the internet so that we can just do it virtually from anywhere we are. And over time, that evolved from just faxing to emails, to phone call outs, to text messages, to posting on a website. And it's evolved slowly into what Peer is today. So when you look at it and when you see it, it doesn't look like a typical even um, emergency management application. Uh, you know, things like WebEOC. WebEOC has a certain look to it, and it functions a certain way because of the audience that's built it. And Peer looks a little different because of the audience that's built it. It's primarily used by uh, public information professionals. So uh, their big clients are the US Coast Guard, um, all of the major oil companies that have offices in the United States, um, and then a lot of governmental entities, including the Houston region. We're actually their biggest customer. We have 56 installs of their product. Um, 
but uh, Georgia Office of Emergency Management, they have it. Um, the SOC here in Texas is purchasing right now. The city of Austin has it. Uh, Dallas-Fort Worth is in the process of purchasing it right now. So they have a pretty widespread customer base, but you'll see going into it, it looks a little different. It functions a little different from software that you're used to. It looks nothing like WordPress, for example. It was not built you know, for, for easy blogging. It was built for sort of crisis communication stuff. So um, when you get into it, kind of keep that in mind as we, as we get, go through some of the terminology. Um, basically, like, um, like we said earlier, it is like WebEOC for PIOs. So what it does is it lets us all communicate on a common platform that's hosted virtually. I guess we call it in the cloud now. Um, you know, in 2000, it wasn't in the cloud. It was hosted virtually. Um, and it allows you to log in from wherever you are and update news releases, um, respond to citizen inquiries, manage contact lists, and everything um, as if you're in the same room. So um, we actually use the product in both functions. So we use it virtually and we use it in the same room. We obviously have traditional joint information centers, but then if you can't make it, you can't make it. Um, we had a flooding incident, as you know, a severe weather incident last, was that last week now already? That was last week, wasn't it, on Monday? And um, we, uh, I needed help in my office. I was acting as PIO and I needed help to have someone come in and write a news release. So I called our gal over at HHS and asked her to come over and help. And she got in their F-250 and tried to come over and couldn't get through all the roadways were underwater. So she went back to her office and signed into Peer, and we just did it virtually. So it's nice to have that capability here. Uh, it's still nice to have people in the room, but it's nice to know that you can go virtual if you need to. Um, so I'm just going to give you, show you guys a couple examples of some pretty successful installations, um, especially some that are locally. I'm going to start, though, um, outside of our state. This is the capital, national capital region. They had to call it national because otherwise people in Texas would just think it was about Texas. Uh, this is, I was typing capital region and even Google thought I just meant Austin. So um, this is the national capital region news and information site. What this is, is obviously in DC, they have a lot of jurisdictions all at play. Um, DC itself is actually fairly small and the surrounding states obviously play a huge role. Most people don't live here in DC who work here in DC. They, they live from all over, so they had to have a region-wide scope site. So what they did was they formed, um, basically it's a joint information center that's up 24-7, but in sort of ready state mode. Um, they've got <clears throat> emergency alerts, weather, traffic, and utilities right on the top of the page. And you'll see right here it says news feeds from, and it pulls in all of the news feeds from all of the various jurisdictions and agencies that are in the region. So. This is very similar to what you guys have been doing for a while with the CEOC, which is operating under a common umbrella, although there's separate entities. Um, and this is a, a pretty good example of how you guys could have a site set up. So for small events, you know, we, a lot of incidents obviously scale up, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. So if something happens at A&M, um, it would pop into this news feed as you know, they updated their page and put out a bulletin about something. Um, and as other jurisdictions pick up, you start to see more and more information populating this page. So this gives you an opportunity to tell the news media, to tell the public, hey, if you hear of something happening, go to this page and there will be information there if something's going on. Um, and this pulls automatically, so there's no extra steps for any of your folks. So if you're currently just updating your website to put out a news bulletin or something, you don't have to do any extra steps. This site will pick it up and put it on the page automatically. So it's sort of a force multiplier there for you. Um, as the event grows, um, you get into where all of a sudden everything on this news feed is all about this incident all of a sudden. And then it's time. We've got to have, our, we've got to have a website for this. We've got to have a place for everyone to go just to get information about this inc incident. It's uncluttered, more focused. And that's where the dark site comes in. So the idea being that there's a second website that sits off to the side and is inactive. Um, there's various levels of inactivity, but basically what we've done in the Houston region is we have a site sitting off to the side and it has a nice banner. You know, it has like, in your case, it would have the CEOC logo up there and it would say, you know, Joint Information Center. We have a little blurb that says, this is the Fort Bend County Joint Information Center. Uh, this is what a Joint Information Center is. Currently there's nothing going on, so this is the message you're reading on this site. Be sure to bookmark it and come back come back later if you hear of something going on. This is where we'll be posting all our updates. So you have that dark site. And then as the event grows, you can actually start building that site out with 
you know, um, like this has these big bright buttons at the top. You could have big buttons on that site, sort of staged in the background, ready to launch for like volunteer management or have questions about donations. So you can put big action buttons for people to be able to click on uh, to, to get key information about the incident. Um, and the two sites, of course, link back and forth um, because it's all built on the peer platform. It's really easy to post updates from one to the other and to sign in and manage them both. Um, <clears throat> I'll show you guys what that looks like. This is actually, um, I've already signed in. This is actually the Fort Bend County Office of Emergency Management's peer site. Um, this is what I'm greeted with when I first sign in. And you'll notice, like I said, it's a little different from WordPress and things. All of the main functionality of the site is broken into several categories here. We've got inquiries, which is all of your interaction with the public. And you can even take, uh, if you have an email address right now, like info at you know, your, your domain, you can actually route that into this regional peer center so that people can just still email you. They still communicate all the same ways, but, and they'll never even know, but you're managing it behind the scenes from this system. The other thing is documents, and that is a, that is a term that peer uses for all content that you're generating. These might be PDF files you're uploading. They might be maps you've created, incident maps. They might be evacuation areas on a map. Could be just a plain old HTML document you're typing up. Um, they have an editor built into this software, so it looks just like Microsoft Word when you're typing stuff up. Um, you know, you're putting in headlines and hyperlinks the same way you would, bolded lists, everything. Um, so that documents is all content. And then contacts is where you manage all of the people who you're interacting with. So we pre-stage um, at Fort Bend, we actually use Peer as a disaster recovery tool for our office. So if something happens to our office when we go down, if we can't get to our Outlook, what do we do? You know, how, how do we send a message out to all the mayors if we've lost our IT infrastructure? So we have mirrored all of our contact lists in here. We have our media list, we have all of our mayors, all of our EMCs, all of our regional players. Um, and then of course we have a community list too of people who have come to us and asked for information. And that's grown organically over three years um, to have about 2,000 people in it now. Of just random citizens from the county who have said, hey, I want to get updated when something goes down. And so we've got them in here too. Um, and those, those three are the main areas. Um, the conferencing basically allows you, it's another disaster recovery feature. If you've lost access to your email, your phone system, and everything, and you need to come in here and talk PIO to PIO or you know, a person to person in here, um, Peer actually has a chat, a chat's chat functionality built in, so you can open up a chat window right in your browser and just start chatting back and forth about stuff. So it's kind of like a fallback, last-ditch effort thing. Um, and then uh, media tools is an extra cost thing that I don't believe you all have access to. Um, most people don't, don't really use that. It's more for um, the public relations world, because what they're able to do is go look at the AP press calendar, be able to pick when stories, what, what, what stories are going to be run. Say you can look and see, OK, in June, CBS is going to be doing a thing on this topic, and so you can kind of plan on writing a press release and tailoring it to that. And then it'll also tell you what, what reporters are kind of be, going to be doing stories on that topic, so you can engage them ahead of time. Not something we use a lot. We don't know when our next incident's going to be, so it's not that convenient for us. Um, and then reporting. Everything in this system, again, because it was born out of a crisis, was designed to comply with the incident command system. So. Everything you do in this system is logged. Um, I could open, I could go to the reports for this site. I, I won't because it launched in 2006 and the log report is, you know, probably 1,200 pages high of paper. But um, everything is logged. When I signed in today to show you this, it was logged. If, when I go to create a test document, it'll be logged. Everything is logged. So at the end of your shift, if, you're, if you guys are filling out ICS forms and doing the 214, when you go to sign out, you go to your report prints a list of everything you did, you print it out, staple it to your 214, and you're good to go. So that, that was designed with that in mind. Also, if documents go missing, you need to know, well, shoot, where'd that press release go? I was just working on that. You can go in and see who moved it to what folder, or hopefully they didn't delete it, but you'd be able to see if they deleted it. And then also, when you're creating documents, all your versions of the document are stacked up in drafts. So if you make a change to a document, um, if I, if I make a change to a document and send it out and then Monica signs in and makes some more changes to it, if I look at her version, I'm like, oh, I don't like that at all. I can go back to my version and post it. Um, so it lets you collaborate that way with documents. So let me give you just a cursory view here. 
how the inquiries work. This is one of the coolest features for us. So in our office, we have about four people who are responsible for applying to general citizen inquiries. So somebody says, they usually think we're the fire marshal's office, so they're usually asking us if they can burn stuff yet. Um, so Joe Citizen comes in, asks us a question, and we got about four people who are supposed to answer those questions. So in the past, we had it going into oem at co.fort-bend.tx.us, one email bucket. So April would open it and she'd reply. Well, I wouldn't necessarily know she replied. So I might go in and I might reply to that person too. Teresa might go in and reply too. On a really bad communication day, someone might get three separate replies. And of course, in a really, really bad communication day, they heard three different things. Hopefully, <laughs> they heard the same thing three times, which is also super annoying and confusing. So this system allowed us basically to be able to see what each other is doing when we're replying to this person. So we have a general, a community inquiry come in. We have eight of them here. We've kind of had a stressful week, so I hope there's nothing in here embarrassing because I'm just going to pull it up and show you guys. Is there a trick to the mouse? Um, sporadically, maybe, because it, sometimes it jumps. Oh, there it is. Oh, just kidding. Oh. I was going too fast for it, I think. OK, so most of this is spam, thank goodness. Um, let me see if we've got a, I'll pull up a real, an old one that's closed that was from an actual human. It seems to be working now. I think it was the receiver. It's time to be moved. Thank you. Um, I can pull up, uh, let's see if I can do one that doesn't invade anyone's privacy. OK, so Terry McCord. Terry McCord came and said he was interested in some uh, CERT training and wanted more info. And you can see here that someone in our office, Valerie, was able to say, hey, Shauna, why don't you reply? Forward it to Shauna. Shauna actually sent Valerie this reply, and Valerie had to send it out. <laughs> um, but she sent it out. We see everything that she did when she sent it. Everything's tracked and logged. So if, if we're interested in keeping and maintaining this information, it's super useful. Um, Nobody came in and sent her a second response. It was all logged and managed. Now, um, sometimes you see where up at the top here, you'll see before Valerie, it says Shauna Evans. So it'll say Shauna Evans viewed this item. And so you'll know, OK, Valerie will sign in and know, oh, Shauna already saw this. I don't need to bother with all this. Shauna already saw it. Because it already says that Shauna's viewed it. Um, so you get to kind of have a little bit more information about that. The, cool, the other cool thing is I can actually click on Terry's name here and pull up her contact information, or his. I guess I've used those interchangeably so far. Um, and be able to see all of the communication that we've had back and forth. And we can see we've got one inquiry from Terry. And then we've actually got all of these documents that we've sent her so far as well. So we have a full history of all of our interactions with her, him, that person. Um, and we can even see what kind of lists we've got them added on to and all that kind of business. So with the media, this is super useful as well. Um, or even with your elected officials and your response partners. We had an issue during our um, flooding where we had a mayor who came back and said, hey, I haven't been getting your alerts. And I was able to go in and see that we were actually sending the alerts. We had the paper trail. I knew the time. I knew the second. I got the receipt back from his email server saying that his server received it. So of course, we're not going to reply to him and go, well, we sent it. But it keeps me from getting fired, at least. <laughs> so we know that we were sending it, and we know there's some accountability there. Um, it also, when it sends out emails, it, uh, you can do read receipts. Um, so it does a regular Outlook read receipt. It pops up and says, hey, someone wants to know that you read this message. Click OK. But it also puts a tracking beacon in that email. So if they open that email and they have images enabled, it's going to phone home and tell us exactly when they open that email. So it gives us a little bit more insight into whether people are reading our messages, um, how often they've read them, if they've read them at all. Um, can keep you out of the fire, but it can also help you diagnose a lot of IT issues you might have for mail delivery. You could say, it says it was delivered. Please check your spam folder. <laughs> I know it went to your server. Please check. Um, so it's a pretty powerful tool in that regard. And of course, um, like I said, most of those inquiries that we get um, the, the folks who, who are asking us questions don't even know we're using this system. Um, we do have a form on our website they can fill out to ask us questions, and it goes to the same place. But uh, most of them are sending us emails, and it's just getting bounced in. So 
Um, inquiries are also categorized as they come in, which is neat. So we actually have like volunteer at code.fortnersband.txt US. If you email that address, it comes in categorized as volunteer opportunities. If you send a generic one, it comes in regular. Um, so you have a lot of different ways you can kind of slice and dice the information. And this gets really important in an incident where you have people logging in and helping from various areas, because now you can actually let people reply to your email. You know, you might be able to give people access to be able to sign in and help you take a load off with your replies to the community. I'll show you the contacts again. <laughs> We're right in the middle of doing some changes, so it's kind of a mess. Um, just ignore the parts that look messy. That's probably there as a mistake. Um, <laughs> We actually have um, all of our contacts loaded pretty much into two groups for our business continuity stuff. Uh, we used to use a system called GroupWise. There's a bunch of contacts in there. Now that we have a new system, they're going into the master contact list and we're migrating it over. But we've got about 1,000 folks um, from our old contact list that are loaded in here. Then we have 1,994 community members who have come and either asked us questions or asked to be on our mailing list. So, these are community members we can reach out to directly from our office via email. Um, many of those gave us uh, mobile phone numbers so we could send them text messages as well. Um, during our ready state, we don't do text messaging because it costs extra. But once there's a disaster, disaster declaration, we uncork that sucker and we start sending text messages out. Because um, if we know we're getting reimbursed, we just go for it. Because um, so, that's, that's a great way to light up people's phones. and. They really, we get a lot of really positive feedback about that, that feature. So, um, and then you'll see down here, um, those are our big buckets, our contact directories. Those are like your Outlook address books. They're your big buckets of contacts. And then down below, we've sliced and diced them to heck. So we've got lists of daycares. We've got daycares broken out by if they're licensed or if they're listed family homes, if they're registered. We've got our Fort Bend County Department emergency coordinators. MROG, our volunteer radio guys, they're in here. Um, Committees we run, animal issues, um, Fort Bend County Coordination Council, uh, preparedness vendors, hazmat policy groups. We've got every way you could possibly slice and dice in here. These are all audiences that we use um, either on a day-to-day -day basis or when bad stuff happens. Um, of course, we've got some old stuff. We probably don't need the swine flu FYI list on there anymore. That probably would make a health person cringe to see that we even called it swine flu anything. but. Um, it is what it is. And then our volunteer list. And this is something we're just starting to do as well is coordinate all of our volunteers on here. So once you finish the CERT class, we dump the roster into here. And whether they like it or not, they're going to start getting updates from us and emergency alerts from us. Um, it's kind of the whole point that went through the class. So we just sign them up. And then we dump them into buckets here. So this is something that's growing. So we can slice and dice a lot of different ways. And when you go to distribute a document, you can choose from any or all of these lists. So you could say, hey, I want to just blast this out to everyone. Or you can go through and pick which ones you want to hit with it. Um, <clears throat> and these lists are kind of organized in a cool way. Um, some of these have this little blue uh, unintelligible mark next to them. Um, it's actually like a synchronized symbol. These lists update automatically. So what we could actually do is we, we can set up on the fly. If we have an incident, um, it's a good example. Oh, we had a, we had a pipeline break uh, about six months ago um, it, near Pecan Grove. And it didn't ignite, thankfully. It was just natural gas and sand, <laughs> which I learned about at that incident that sand comes flying out to. Um, sounded like a roaring jet engine. We evacuated the homes in the immediate area. But then there was, a, there was a certain distance around the area of people who heard jet engine sounds. And they didn't know what it was, but they knew something bad had happened. And we wanted to reach out to those folks. You can actually open up um, in Peer. You can actually create a new group um, based off of someone's geographic coordinates. So we were able to actually create, um, <clears throat> I'll walk through it just real quick here, a basic group. And I'll call this uh, test uh, geo group or grow group, geo group. Um, and you can actually say, I want these, I want to get everyone who's within one mile of a certain Latin long. And set it up. And that list is actually going to update automatically. As new people come in and sign up, if they provide their address, it's going to automatically add them into this group if they meet the criteria. So you can set these up ahead of time even. If you have like areas predefined, um, like, for example, certain jurisdictions, 
you could have them predefined and have contact lists that automatically update as people come and sign up for the for information on the site. <clears throat> so that that's a really cool feature. Um, and then again, w this product is kind of interesting in that it allows virtually it allows you to do virtually anything communication wise. Now the major downside to that is that you have screens like this. <laughs> You can do probably a thousand different things on this screen when all you want to do is one. And so from a communications perspective, it's really frustrating. From a training perspective, it's a little difficult. You got to get people trained up on sort of function specific stuff because the drink from the fire hose of everything this thing does is a little bit overwhelming. And then I'll show you all content. If you guys have questions, by the way, go ahead and just shout them out or spend time waiting for screens to load and stuff. So. Um, an example here would be our news releases. Um, it's a very familiar looking folder structure to what you'd have in Windows. You know, you can nest folders and kind of organize information that way. Um, there's different colors because folders can be purely internal to where you just post things and they don't ever go on the website. They just kind of live inside here for your other communicators to see. Um, or you can also post them publicly. Uh, so there's kind of different color codes. Obviously, our news releases folder is public. Um, we can see here Shauna Evans posted um, something for our MUDs. Um, I can hover over that and get her contact information. Um, I can even view the distribution. I can see who she sent this to. She sent it to 218 people a month ago. Um, <clears throat> I can actually see she sent it to the MUD console personnel, our PIO network special districts, or MUD readiness program, and the print media. I can view our recipients, and this is where those tracking beacons are really neat. I can actually see that it was delivered to Jeff Braun, and that he's opened it twice. <laughs> um, and then for other folks, um, Doug didn't activate his beacon, so I just see that it was sent, um, that it went to his server. And then I, the cool thing is I can click on exceptions, and this is my report of every, all the bad email addresses I have. So when I send this out, instead of getting a massive bounce back, like with 2,000 community members in here, you can bet there's some bad email addresses. And instead of just having my inbox just crushed by those, it just goes into here as a nice report. I can, I can print this out. I can export it to Excel and hand it to our clerk and let her go through and clean out the email addresses. Um, but it, it, this is a great way to verify that people are or are not getting information. And content is created super easily. Um, I, I'll go to a new document and click blank. <clears throat> we'll give it a sec to load here. Um, you see we've got a, kind of our full suite of editor options. You can do pretty much anything on here that you can do in Word. Um, or You can do pretty much anything in here that is common to do on the internet, I should say. There are things you can do in Word that don't live online. So this is pretty much your version of all your options you have. You can insert images, insert videos. Um, you can insert dynamic content from elsewhere on the site. Um, all kinds of cool stuff. If you have a techie, geeky person, they can even type HTML straight into this thing. So if you want to drop widgets onto stuff or anything like that, you can do that too. Um, really straightforward formatting. Um, give it a title, put it in a folder, and then you'll see right here I've got a button right at the top. I'm an approver and an administrator. So I can just click Publish and Send, and it's on the website. So once this content works, I click one button and it's posted. Um, the send part, it pops up a screen, asks me who I want to send it to. I select them and hit send and it sends. So it's really um, including all the confirmation and pop-up dialogues, are you sure you want to do this? It's probably five or six clicks to post something to the internet and send it to all your lists. So it's pretty, it's pretty streamlined in terms of getting stuff done. Now, <clears throat> I mentioned I was an approver. That's the other neat thing about these documents. They don't just, not anyone can post. Uh, a document has to be approved before it can be published. And you can set that up behind the scenes um, so that you have certain folks on an approver list. And you can actually set, set approvals by folder even. So if you have preparedness tips and you kind of want that to be more open, you know, people can post, a lot of people can post in there, you can have a lot of approvers on that list. For like news releases, you might just have your PIO your PIO is on that approval list, so one of them has to approve it. But you can set that up. So an average user who's not an approver would sign in, and all they'd see is submit for approval, close, and cancel. So when they're done with the document, they click submit for approval. The system handles it, emails it out to everyone on the approval list. 
they can come in and approve it, and once it's approved, it's ready to be published. So it actually handles that on its own. Um, setting, set, all you have to do is pay, pretty much set it up to match whatever policies you guys have in place right now for the approval steps. Um, the one thing that we've run into that it doesn't do, that I kind of wish it did, was tiered approvals to where this has to be approved by you know, so-and-so first, and then it goes to Daniil, the judge's PIO. So it doesn't have that. What it has is both of those people are on the list, and they both have to approve it before it can be sent out. So that's, a, that's our, our workaround for that. Along, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it stores templates. Yeah. In fact, um, your, your top 10 templates are showed on the right, on the left side here. And um, so to create, if I wanted to create a new winter storm watch, I just click on it. And it actually pulls up our template of winter storm watch. And I can go in and make all the changes I need, click publish and send. And these are shared across, so if you guys are all sharing one peer center, a predefined set of templates is shared basically then across the area. So you all can have access to that. Um, you'll notice that these documents are pretty devoid of flourish. This one in particular is a plain text document, but even if you went into our news releases, um, you'd notice that they're, they look pretty plain. Um, the reason for that is that a lot of the style of how things look once they're posted onto the website is pre-configured. So I've gone in there ahead of time and I've set up what I want our news release template to look like. And I'll, I'll pull up an example. <clears throat> I'll show you a news release if I can find one here. <clears throat> uh, yeah, I'll pull up Missouri City's update here about flooded roads. So on our external website, you know, we've got the seal up here. Then the contact information is actually automatically populated by the system. The headline, all this formatting, everything from here up is automatic. All I had to do to type this message was punch this stuff in and click publish and send. Didn't have to worry about formatting or prettiness. Now the neat thing about that is, um, it's really complex, but this contact information set, we use the generic one for this. A lot of times we'll use a contact info set called PIO, and we go in and fill in, say it's my information, and I work the day shift. Well, when I go home, when I sign out of my shift and the new PIO comes in, they go in and fill in their information, and once they click save, all of even the old releases that I wrote get updated with their contact info at the top. So I can actually go home and sleep without my cell phone ringing from the media for a while, and they'll be getting the calls about it. And then when I come back on shift, we change it back, and all the documents update again. So it's really, for a crisis, for an actual incident, it's really well, well built out. Um, and then, um, like if we hit, uh, if we go print friendly, and I haven't tried this in Internet Explorer for a while, so I hope this works okay. Chasing all the changes down in these browsers is a challenge. So you'll notice that this is yet another version. You know, there's no menu bar and stuff, but we pulled in the logo and put the logo up there. So you can really pre-configure it so that when you're actually creating the content, all you have to think about is the content, nothing else. And then everything else just gets automatically set up when it's time to go. Um, any questions so far? <laughs> kind of a lot. It's a big system. Yeah. Say that, okay, when you publish that to your website, what does it look like on the website? Is it a link or is it a, or does it look just like that? Good question. Um, I mean, there's a couple different ways that it looks. I mean, the first one is when you're viewing like a folder of information, it looks like this. And this is all configurable. This is just how we have ours set up. Um, it looks like this, you know, kind of some shading on every other line and then just a list of documents. Um, Pictures look different. Pictures have a special look and feel to them. So if I go to pull up pictures of our Pierce Communications Tower, this is a little bit more of like a photo gallery. Sorry, we archived these here. <clears throat> Where it actually kind of shows a little thumbnail on the right side and then the, an image description. So there's a couple different ways that it appears inside the folder. Um, on the actual home page, um, on our site, we have a little section um, that lists all our recent updates. 
So wind advisory and meeting reminders and all that kind of stuff. And then we've got, we've fed in, like uh, my boss, Jeff Braun, has an emergency management blog he updates. And so we've actually been able to pull that in. So his most recent blog post comes in here as well. And weather and all that. I have a question. You say that all of this can be configured. Is that what we were talking about earlier offline, that 80 hours that we're paying yeah. for them to do? So this is not something that we're necessarily going to have to figure Correct. out how to do. They're going to do for us. Correct. Okay. So we'll just have to be trained on how to put in the content, how to yeah. make the contacts. But as far as the look and feel of it, that's something that the company is going to do for us. That's correct. Now, I like having IT folks in your organization who know how to update it, though. Like, because I can dance my way around the back end, it's really helpful. Um, there's stuff we don't really want to call peer for, like, hey, we got a higher resolution version of the logo we want to start using, or it's no longer blue and white, now it's green and yellow. It's nice to have someone who knows how that works. So we, it would be a good idea to get your IT folks trained up on at least how the administrative stuff works. Yes? Lock. be one entity that buys it, but what we've done a lot of times is do uh, like um, interlocal agreements to get a lot of people to pitch in to pay for it. So we even, even smaller than the county level in Fort Bend County, in Northwest Fort Bend County, we have five really small cities like Fulcher, Simonton, Weston Lakes, those guys, and they've actually all banded together and bought one under their ESD. So you're, you're even able to find more granular ways to do that. And especially places where you already have interlocal agreements in place, it's really easy to do that. Yeah. yeah. It would have been phenomenal there. Um, that was that was actually really too bad that we didn't use it because Montgomery County actually has a peer license and they really could have, but they didn't. Um, I actually called Nikki and said, hey, Nikki, do you need help? Like, can I come up and can we get your peer thing? And he was like, we're fine. So we didn't, we didn't do anything there, but we really should have. Um, and our region, region-wide, doesn't have a dark site like what y'all are talking about having. And so it, it makes it a little complicated because where it's a tri-county thing, if you've got Montgomery County doing it, those other two counties aren't actually part of the UAZI area, and so they don't have access to the peer tools. So Montgomery County would have to take some initiative and say, we're rebranding our peer site to the tri-county thing and just shift it all over. Um, and it's a lot easier when you have a dark site like that floating around that you can use. So that's a really good move. Thanks for the information. Yeah, now you know, the more you know. Can you talk a little bit about how So we kind of got burned um, earlier this year. How many of y'all use Facebook? OK, handful. Um, we got burned earlier this year, and Facebook decided they weren't going to allow you to import RSS feeds as notes on your page anymore. Um, I think that came into effect uh, last year, not this year, last year. Um, came into effect, I think, in October, um, where they all of a sudden just blocked that functionality. And that's what a lot of us relied on <laughs> in the emergency management community for updating our Facebook pages dynamically. So a lot of our Facebook pages just went dark. Um, what we've done since then is actually Peer has a new enhancement in their software that lets us update Facebook directly from inside the Peer system. So when you create, you can create documents for Facebook and just publish them straight to that platform. Um, it's probably better than the solution that we had before because now all that stuff is logged. Whereas before, we were having major records retention headaches. Uh, our consensus in our county was kind of like, let's pretend like this isn't a problem unless somebody sues us, and then we'll go figure out what we're doing wrong here. Because it was just impossible to try to figure out how to convince Facebook, who are typically pretty uh, antagonistic towards their customers, that they need to save things for seven years to match our records retention policy. So. Um, this way, we get to update things and just publish them straight over. I'll show you, uh, I'll give you an example of how that works. Let me cancel this. Um, a recommendation uh, is that 
content created for Facebook is created for Facebook. Um, it's very helpful to not use your, not just dump your regular stuff in there like we were doing before. Um, you get a lot better results on Facebook if you create content for Facebook. Um, so shorter blurbs, more direct communication, less press release speak. Um, so what we've done is we actually set up a folder called Facebook Updates, and uh, we're just starting to use this. So we can create a new document, and the title that we give it here is the headline of the note on Facebook. The content we put in here is the content of the note on Facebook, including any images that we include on here. And when we click Publish and Send, it goes straight over to Facebook. Um, the neat thing about that is that then if someone comes and comments on our post, that comment comes into Peer as an inquiry. And if we reply to it in Peer, it actually posts a comment reply on Facebook to their comment. So we can actually have documented two-way dialogue with folks on Facebook, all also from this tool. And the exact same thing for Twitter as well. Twitter has a few extra um, functionality things built into it. For emergency management, um, for example, you're able to set up um, like certain Twitter hashtags, like categories, and map them to inquiry categories. So you could actually tell people, um, City of Houston did this. It was pretty amazing. During the flooding event, they posted a page on their website that said, hey, tell us how you're doing. Um, reply to us on Twitter and use one of the following categories. And the categories were like, my street's flooded, my power's out, you know, various categories that they could use. And all that stuff came in and generated a giant inquiry report for them in here. Um, so they were able to actually just kind of view at a glance all the different sort of reports they were getting in from their citizens. So that was really neat. Um, it's actually really, really well built out for Twitter in crisis. <clears throat> yes? Yeah, you can set up multiple Facebook accounts, and you can have multiple folders that go to different accounts. So if you want to have one folder set up that goes to all the Facebook accounts, and then have individual folders for the individual accounts, you can do that too. So it's pretty neat. Who does it show the posting for the individual? Um, whoever authenticated the link. So um, if, uh, if like City of Bryan, went on and set it up to go to their Facebook page. When they posted something into that folder, it would go into the Facebook page as City of Brian. So basically, it's kind of as additional administrators, in a way? In a way, yeah, yeah in a way. Um, because if it, like mm -hmm. I don't have administrative rights to the city's Facebook page, but if I were to go in and post something to it from this, it would come from the city. Assuming, of course, they've allowed that and stuff, but yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And so we can still do stuff behind the scenes for our own jurisdictions and never actually be messing with the CEOC website if we wanted to. That's correct. So we can use this to manage our own stuff. For the social like media side. Emails or social media or stuff like that. Yeah. So for some of those smaller scale stuff that doesn't necessarily involve a whole jig, mm -hmm. we could still be managing our own stuff. And then if we need to, Absolutely. You have a folder which has, uh, for instance, the kind of advisory in the free morning. Uh -huh. And then you talk about there's a Facebook update folder. Is there any way to automatically say, copy this to the Facebook folder so that you don't have to have it do it here and do it here? Yeah, so not right now. Okay. So, what we have now is we've got our Facebook folder. What we're probably also going to do is go ahead and map our alerts folder to our Facebook page also. Just we're, we're going to map our, map our alerts folder to our Facebook page also. So we can have our specialized Facebook content, but then also every alert. Um, if we decide to go that route, I mean, we've actually been debating whether we're going to do alerts on Facebook at all, because we do them on Twitter, and we'll see how that pans out. Yeah. So yeah, and, and the, really the ability to pull mentions and comments out of those services and dump them in here is the biggest value for us. Because with Facebook, you know, I'll get a notification or my boss will get a notification if someone comments on our wall um, on Facebook. But 
that's just two of us. You know, I don't really want to add all the other folks in our office to our Facebook page as administrators just so they can reply to comments. It will, we're much more likely to give them access to the inquiries here and only have one or two administrators on our actual Facebook page. And, and for Twitter, the great thing is Twitter doesn't actually notify you unless you have an app installed when somebody replies to your Twitter feed or mentions you on Twitter. So there was no way before for us to get that in like email form and pull it in unless we use some third party service and all that stuff. So this way, replies are actually logged and documented and notifications are sent and people can actually get in and use stuff. So. Yeah. Um, or are they the same moderators that they on Well, in terms of the information coming back into Peer, there's no approval process. So if somebody comments on your Facebook page, it will just come back in. But yes, in terms of putting stuff in the Facebook folder and pushing it to Facebook, it does have to be approved before it can be pushed. So. Is that approval here on a local level or on, on the off level? Um, just on the, on the system itself, however you have it configured. Uh, local level, yeah. So we can have someone here be an approver. Yeah, exactly. Basically, we'll decide like internally who has approval just to submit versus who has who has to be approved. You know that kind of thing. So we could all. I mean, technically, we could all in here be people that could publish to the website. And then if you had, you know, we have extra PIOs coming in. Let's say from the pin group, if it was some type of big emergency, maybe we would only have them be able to create a document, but then it would still have to be approved by one of us before we can publish it. That kind of a thing. So this would basically give us an operating platform to work with in, inside the room and document and log everything, and then if we were separated, we could also work in the same way. So we use it together in this room or separated or right. just it help log everything that we do. And it would be helpful with our field PIOs, we've got people that are on scene and people that are here, you know, I think it, it'd be a really great tool so that way, you know, they might be writing something, we make sure it's approved and sent up or however we want to do that. I think it's got endless possibilities. It really helped link us virtually because a lot of times, especially at the beginning of the incident, it may take us a while to get our PIOs here, but you guys can still be working together and news releases and things like that through the peer system. Before we would just pass papers here or there by hand and there really be no, we just work on our own personal feeds, Facebook and Twitter, and there would really, this kind of centralizes everything together. You can use it that way. You know, it's really up to us to decide how we want to use it. Locke's just been kind of showing us all the possibilities of ways we can use it. I think that's where future meetings come into play is, okay, how do we really want to get this thing set up? Because once we get the funding and we get it, and they come and train us and all that stuff, and they come to build it out the first time, that's when we need to already know, okay, this is how we want to do it. And their trainings are going to be, I was just telling these guys earlier, when Peer comes in and trains, they train basically, they have a basic and an advanced course, and they cover every button, every single feature in the entire software. So it's really kind of a drink from a fire hose experience where you feel a little paralyzed walking away from it, to be honest. So finding out what you're going to do in the system, you know, before you get to that point is going to be really helpful because those trainings, while they're going to be very informative, are not necessarily going to help cement in your mind what you're going to actually use this thing for. So that's a good thing to figure out ahead of time. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I don't have to be home till 3.30, so. Um, and then I guess the a couple of things that I would advise is um, we have a work group in our region that just focuses on the peer implementation across the region. Now, our install is huge because we have the 56 different sites, but it's probably a good idea to have some group here that's you know, a focus group or a task force set out to get this thing implemented and keep it running. Um, we went for a long time without policies and procedures, and we're finally writing up policies and procedures for this system um, for the region. That's very helpful. Um, last year, we had our first exercise 
we did a, a communications exercise on peer and that was super helpful to get people clicking through it. Um, try to integrate it as much as you can into what you guys are doing. It'll make it a lot easier when something bad does happen and you actually have people who know how it works. Big, that's a big, strong recommendation. <laughs> How do you get the information out to the public? If we come together, we'll all just send everyone to this site, to the dark site, what you call it. Yeah. The, and that's where, where we want to post up. Instead of saying, go to the Brian Police Department's Facebook page, it's a major incident. We, we want you to go to this page. That's where, where it's all going to be displayed. Yeah. That's, um, we were talking about that earlier. Grab, a, <clears throat> grab like an address, a web address for the dark site, even though it's a dark site and just have it in your back pocket so when something happens like on hour one you can tell people go to bvceoc.org uh, for emergency information and that might be the least appealing web address ever but at least it's generic enough that if it's a tornado if it's a train derailment whatever it is um, you can go register another domain name if you need to later down the road but at least you've got something that works that minute um, an example would be like uh, they use this for like the deep water horizon response. And obviously that's a little different because you have energy companies and you've got like image management stuff going on there. But you know, they registered the domain name Deepwater Horizon and sent people there. But it takes like 48 hours for domain names to, you know, propagate and spread throughout the internet. So you still need something for that stopgap for that first part. So if even if you ever did want a better domain name for it, it's good just to have that bad one in your back pocket ready to use when you need it. Like we have fbcjic.org for Fort Bend County JIC. Public's never gonna know what that means, but it's only six characters long and it's easy to get out there in the news releases. So. Anything else? <laughs> yes. Well, the most obvious answer is that everyone's been trained on one platform, so it's really easy to share resources. Um, the, there is actually some integration, though. Um, I was explaining earlier to, to these guys that because the peer system is hosted in one place, it's actually um, hosted in Virginia and then co-located in Dallas and in the Seattle area. Um, because it's hosted in one place, so there's one install, everybody's username is unique. So there's only one lock in the peer system. You can't go get the username lock because I've already taken it. There's only one D Timmons. There's only one of each username. So if something happens in Houston and we've got a major problem and it's far out of our control and we need some help, we could always ask you all, can one of you guys you know, sign in and start monitoring our community inquiries? And we could link your username to our site and you could come in and start working just you know, just right off the bat. We could link you in with certain permissions and you'd be set, all set. The other thing is peer sites have this concept of a family. So your two sites will be in one peer family. What that allows you to do is push documents around from site to site and share things kind of internally that you can't necessarily do across the peer universe. So if something big happened, if we had a big old hurricane that was hitting the Gulf Coast, you know, we might start a new site family and put you guys in it and Austin and Dallas-Fort Worth and Houston so that we can share information behind the scenes more fluidly. And public wouldn't see that, that'd be an administrative thing that we do. So we could actually share information a lot better then. So three answers to your question. <laughs> and this is something, um, like I said, the SOC has purchased it. Um, they have a handful of licenses. Um, when we were talking to them about it originally, um, they called because they had some questions about it. They wanted to hear what I thought so they didn't have to listen to the vendor talk. But um, we really urged them at the, at the state level to think about this as a statewide tool. Um, it's great you all having the initiative to have a dark site. You know, we need to have a dark site. I think Dallas-Fort Worth is purchasing a dark site. It would be great if when there was a declared disaster, the state made a dark site, you know, kind of available to whatever the affected region is. So we're kind of playing with some ideas at the state level too. And um, because it's in its early phases, we're kind of looking to WebEOC as a model 
where you know we have a state server and we have a state work group and we have a lot of stuff going on at that level that we can tap into for resources and I'm hoping we can get there with the peer pretty soon. Anything else? I don't want to keep you guys for longer. It's already 11 o'clock, so or after. I guess if anybody else has any, I didn't really have any other agenda items for today. I really just wanted to give Bob um, all the time that we put in. But um, again, this is something that we're going to discuss more. Maybe at another meeting, we'll have a second one. Uh, you guys can go back and think about this. For any of your people that were not here today, um, we'll have a video of this kind of overview. Um, so if you need to watch it again or you want to watch it again, um, if you have more questions, it's great thing you can talk to the friend. <laughs> um, and so, you know, he's always available for us if you have additional questions and we can compile them together and then send an email with some more detailed questions if we have something come up. Um, but I think this is going to be a great tool. Um, obviously, we need more training and you know, this is just an overview. Um, but I think it's something that we'll be able to Really, I think it'll be within the next 90 days. I think we'll, I think we'll purchase it within the next 90 days. Uh, now, how long it takes for us to get our training and all that? Sure. And implementation. But I think the real, the key here is that we can use it on a day-to-day -day level for your own individual operations that y'all do, and get familiar with it, and then you know, then during an emergency. Curious, do you, do you guys see this as something that would be good? I mean, I, I really do. I, I would love the whole concept. John kind of called it um, kind of like a PIO intranet. Yeah, you know, we all have our, each department has their own internal intranet. It becomes like our JIC intranet that we can work with. It's kind of neat. I'm surprised we haven't had anything like this. It's kind of neat. I think it's great that we put all of the media contacts and stuff, we can make sure it's one central location, they're always updated and everybody can use them on a day-to-day -day basis to, to ping those groups. And then we're not each working off of, you know, 10 different media lists, you know, it's something that we can keep there. There's other uses that I can see for it internally for our organization, I know. Um, but I mean, I think that's kind of the good stuff. And then if something big is happening in College Station and Rhonda needs help, she can call John and John can get on there and start helping her, you know, it doesn't even have to be something that, you know, we necessarily activate the entire gym for, but we can help each other out during some of these incidents. It's usually the call of my problems. <laughs> well, I can do that. Course, so we create work for each other, pretty much. Instead of working together, we create work. And another that's thing that's really, on purpose. another thing that's really appealing about it is that, that crisis site, or whatever we end up calling that, that dark site. I don't care how many hits that thing gets, you're not going to have a problem with that. I mean, this thing handled the BP oil spill, so it's going to handle a suspected shooter at the university, and it's not going to—it's not going to crash. It's not going to, you know, give us problems. So I think that's a really—that's a really important. And from a university perspective too, in our region, University of Houston uses it. At any given time, they have about 86,000 contacts loaded into it of current session students, past session students, faculty, staff, parents, interested information people. And whenever they've had incidents, you know, they, they don't even hesitate, they blast to the entire list. They just light up 86,000 email addresses at once. And um, they actually had an, had an issue with it at first because they were doing, using it for automated callouts. And when they tested it, they crashed their phone system at the university because it just crushed it. Um, so it's great for, it's great for that scale of communication. There's not really, we haven't really run into a real good way to break it so far. We've, we've tried. I want to get somebody from the University of Houston up here to talk to whoever you, Leslie, Monica, think would be, you know, advantageous to be at that. I can, I can get that set up. So I've got some contacts down there within uh, public relations. We can do that, and I'm sure Locke can tell us who to get to. I don't know, maybe like game day, traffic information, weather information, you know, I, I, possibilities are endless, but you can use it. 
using it on a day-to-day -day basis is a really good idea, even for non-emergency stuff. And we, even though for us, our grant requirements are that it's used for counterterrorism because it's a UASI grant, but shoot, we have no problem telling people to post like firefighter barbecue information on there because we need to have your hands on the keyboard in this thing so you know how it works when stuff goes down. So.